It has taken us 100 hours to get here. Bodies lay in our wake, and our allies ever rest at our camp. Welcome to Act 3 of the Lone Wolf Challenge. At this point in the run, we need to break out every cheesy strategy I know of and push forward with psychotic resolve. As a note for Act 3, I have increased the difficulty to Tactician for some added drama and content. We begin Act 3 by being reintroduced to our new villains for this arc, Hot Topic E-Boy and Red Flag. As you stride towards the city of Baldur's Gate, the DM's only friend finds rest within camp which is very quickly cut off by these assholes. We quickly run through the portal to find a Mind Flayer in trouble. OMG, I wonder who this could be. Coming to the Emperor's aid, we fail the first two combat encounters on behalf of them being not one, but four monks ready to beat my a and his. The Emperor kept trying to dominate them, but they kept using stillness of mind to immediately get rid of it. So he was really just a walking sack of hit points that didn't do much. Luckily, after enough time, my big hammer and some safe scumming, don't judge me, the Emperor was able to take back control of Prince Orpheus and we discover that the Emperor is actually the one who has kept us from transforming into a Mind Flayer, also known as our Dream Visitor. So after that long bit of exposition, the Emperor offers to put a special worm in our brain, one that will increase- and YOINK! Now we somehow have added on to the list of descriptors from the last act with the addition of Half Illithid. The main thing I wanted from this was the innate fly speed, which is just super convenient to get around. After gaining my new brainworm powers, I managed to convince my way into the circus of the last days with said newfound powers, and quickly made my way to Akabi the totally trustworthy Jinny. So, after quickly realizing he's running a scam, the way to get past this is by pickpocketing his magic ring off of him that lets you cast Mage Hand. You can pickpocket this even if you fail your perception check, by the way. After spinning the wheel again without the ring in play, we win his YouTube giveaway, and he sends us back to the Jurassic era to fight some Velociraptors. Jesus, talk about a sore loser. To win this entire area, you can just cast Darkness and use cantrips or a variety of spells to deal with them. Unfortunately, Darkness is less than effective here because their Pounce ability will knock you prone on a failed saving throw, so I highly recommend the Boots of Striding since they are the only boots in the game that prevent you from being knocked prone, and getting knocked prone causes the immediate loss of concentration on any spell in the game regardless of how high your con save is. So as long as you're concentrating on Darkness, it should basically never drop. After using my big hammer on the dinosaurs, we were able to acquire Nyrulna, a legendary trident that deals innate thunder damage and cannot be disarmed from you, making it an always great choice if you have the ability to use it. I would argue it's one of the better overall weapons in the game, especially for a throwing base character like a Frenzy Barbarian. I decided to use it for a good little change of pace. After returning to the circus, we get a statue commissioned in all of my glory, and approach center stage with Dribbles the Clown, who turns out to be a cultist. Wow, I'm so shocked. It's almost like I've, I've played this before. After the monsters dismember the entire crowd, we barely scrape by with the help of the local bards and the unsung hero of Baldur's Gate, Fred the Janitor, who valiantly fought against both the monsters and rampant need for capital gains with his terrible circus job. He just knocked the- oh my god. Fred, you're gaming, my guy. No, Fred! Guys, <laughs> Fred died! After that whole ordeal, I decided I want to try a new multi-class setup of Gloomstalker and Assassin Rogue with dual crossbows to see how it fares in the upcoming encounters. Needing to possibly pick up some new equipment, I headed to the local blacksmith to shop for some new items and god it's this big. After leaving her on red, we make our way to the real storefront and stock up on some items, including some more special arrows and a finesse two-handed glaive, the Dancing Breeze, which will actually come in handy much later for a very specific boss fight. After exploring a bit of Rivington, we approach the gates of Worms Crossing and end up in a combat with the guards at the front of the gate, which ends very poorly multiple times. After changing back to my big hammer build though, it was a surprisingly decisive battle even against that one steel watcher, especially when using darkness. Making our way into Worms Crossing, we stumbled upon our resident Disney villain again, who wanted us to use the Orphic Hammer to break Orpheus free, which we really don't want to do, but it did let us in on the fact that Raphael's House of Hope might have some particular items that would help us on our journey if we were to somehow conveniently find ourselves there. 
but we are unfortunately too low level for that at the moment. So instead, I decided to do some shopping. On my shopping trip, we pick up the Cloak of Displacement, which I think is arguably the best cloak in the entire game. It gives you the effects of blur at the start of every one of your turns, and stays up as long as you don't get hit. This means that with a 21 AC and disadvantage on attacks against me regardless of being in darkness or not, I am now incredibly difficult to hit. We persuade our way through the guards this time and meet Hot Topic E-Boy on the day of his inauguration. Gortash says he wants us to deal with Orin the Red so he and I can work together to control the Elder Brain. I agree to it, but let's be honest, I'm just gonna kill both of them eventually anyways. Still on the hunt for more equipment, I made my way towards the Emperor's hidden stash in the basement of this tavern. Full of rats. After my mental breakdown, I hit this button and found myself in a difficult situation. Gith have taken over this area and will immediately see me if I walk in front of them. What the game doesn't tell you is that the only one you need to avoid contact with is the one patrolling the very center of the room. The other Gith at the sides of the room won't trigger the dialogue. So I relied on the most powerful of tactical strategies to clear this encounter. Barrelmancy. By teleporting to the sides of the room, you can ignore the dialogue and find yourself in a very convenient position. This area also doesn't count as a danger zone, meaning we can hop back and forth from camp to grab plenty of barrels, which results in this. Items, we use a smoke powder arrow and blow this the hell up. No time for mercy. Even with two enemies left, Gith are almost impossible to fight because they have spells that they never run out of, which makes it incredibly difficult to fight them since they can infinitely spam hold person on you, which isn't aggravating at all. Not even mentioning their almost unlimited Battlemaster features. Like seriously, this is, it's, it's such a pain in the Regardless of my salt, I loot the Emperor's old chambers and exit through the sewer. Upon opening the door deeper in, Lazelle comes running out of the sewer. Oh, never mind, it's this bitch again! She's kidnapped Lazelle for a ritual or whatever. We'll get to it eventually, I guess. I move onward to Sorceress Sundries to gather more supplies, buying the Ring of Regeneration and a few spell scrolls. I move onward toward the Stormshore Armory and adopt a new strategy to acquire the items I want. The first step to the strategy is getting them to like you. I usually find that a couple thousand gold pieces helps them to become your friend, just like real life. Then you'll want to cast Feign Death on them so they don't panic immediately when you rifle through their entire storefront they carry in their back pocket. I recommend fully classing into Thief Rogue using the Gloves of Thievery, Smuggler's Ring, and having expertise in sleight of hand. I don't think it actually calculates properly because I had a plus 13 bonus and would often fail DC 17 pickpocket checks despite the massive bonuses. This tactic works extremely well for a character because as a drow, you get the innate ability to cast darkness, which lets you basically steal everything within broad daylight. We managed to acquire some new equipment. Most importantly, the Armor of Agility. It has a base 17 AC and has no limit to the amount of your dexterity can add onto it. So, that boosts our AC even further to 22 with the shield. And we still have the Cloak of Displacement, so that's actually a ridiculously hard target to hit. With the ever-present need for more experience, I took down some fish people at the docks for a ridiculous amount of damage with a Chain Lightning. We then encountered some Cultists of Ball after spotting them with Sea Invisibility. While they basically killed everyone in the park, we managed to survive by sitting within my cloud of darkness. Like, um, like, uh, like, uh, what's a, what's a simile? Uh, like one of my cool subscribers! Hit the f sub button and the, and the like button too. Thank you. Knowing we needed to take down the Steel Watch eventually, I decided to cut to the chase and head to the Foundry, where we found our local optometrist Volo in a Wild West scenario. After completely and utterly decimating his captors, he gives us a book with some interesting information regarding Orin the Red. Not wanting to go into the Foundry ill-prepared, I took a long rest and ended up in an awkward situation with the Emperor. Sorry, I prefer my lovers without tentacles. Thanks. Sneaking my way inside of the foundry, I immediately saw two individuals minding their own business. Unfortunately for them, they chose the wrong god to worship, and I misjudged their abilities. After being dropped to below half my health, I resorted to good ol' reliable darkness, and used my big hammer on them. I, I switched back to it for the meme. After moving forward, I found out this place is actually where I work in real life, except they still treat these characters better than our employees, and I can tell because they must be getting paid enough to fight against me in my big hammer. 
and somehow all have more total health than I do, and they're literal slaves. But I digress. After using darkness for the 56th time in a row, their brains literally stop functioning and they sort of just let me win the encounter. So it sounds like a skill issue to me. The next room was chock full of enemies that I definitely couldn't handle, so we needed to take our time to clear out everyone here. I started with darkness, big surprise, and dropped a bunch of smoke powder bombs across the room in order to start off with a massive amount of damage against the crowd of cultists. I unfortunately broke my cloud of darkness, and after barely surviving the onslaught of attacks from the angry enemy AI, I took my position at the top of the stairs and managed to kill all the cultists with my big hammer before heading out to regather my resources to fight against the two watchers that chased me down. We re-entered the area with full health, stood in darkness, and spammed Eldritch Blast because they kept playing coy with me. After they self-destructed, we leveled up again to level 11, taking another level in Cleric, not that it really matters at this point and took a potion of angelic slumber to gain the effects of a long rest before we take on the Steel Watcher Titan. See? Hey, it's freaking Voltron. Okay. They seem to like have really high de How do giant robots have 22 dexterity? Okay, he's just gonna heal up, all right. Okay, I mean, I mean, you know, we can just, we can just leave. We can just leave, right? Okay, good. All right, sick. Um, hell yeah. So, yeah, that didn't, <laughs> that didn't go well. After re-strategizing, I found the Steel Watcher Helm, which completely negates blindness and gives advantage on constitution saving throws, which includes concentration checks. We also gathered up the ingredients for the Hellfire Engine Crossbow and grabbed it from the workbench for that extra option for lightning damage. In addition, I finally grabbed the Boots of Striding, which completely negates the ability to be knocked prone as long as you're concentrating on a spell, such as Darkness. This means we should basically never drop concentration on Darkness since we can't be knocked prone by the Steel Watchers and we can maximize the 10 rounds that Darkness lasts. So we should be able to take this fight straight on. While it still should be a challenge, we've raised our levels to their own. Let's kick it. Okay, here we go. We gotta get all these guys wet. I know that sounds crazy, but... <laughs> Hear me out. But we can just use it right here and see what happens. Destructive Wrath. Ooh, 100... Four points of damage? Yeah, it's not the best I've had, but it works. You should not be able to be knocked prone. Yes! Oh my god, it works! That's beautiful. Hopefully this is even possible. I actually have no idea if this is possible. I just honestly hopped straight in here without any clue as to what I was doing. I'm gonna go back. We just have to keep damaging this guy. We gotta focus on this. Yeah, it's just hard to deal enough damage to him. Um, can we do Quicken Spell and do a second one of those? Does Shocking Grass technically deal more damage if it's if he's vulnerable? It's like basically always automatically doubled. Yeah, we'll do Shocking Grass. Yeah, 36, so that's just better. And he goes defensive, he's just gonna regen his health, so... Fine. Uh, recast darkness. Nice, poor damage, yes, that's what I'm talking about. We just keep on using shield, and we just shocking grasp this guy to death, and it should be pretty much GG's. Ow! What? Critical miss, that does suck, actually. Uh, okay. This is so exciting, isn't it, guys? Oh my god. Riveting gameplay. Ugh, what is this guy's AC anyway? Only 16, that's actually way lower than I was expecting. Guy who has shields for legs, I thought, you know. Maybe. Oh, critical hit! We take those. 
What? He is... Self-destructing. Um... Okay, sure. I forgot he did that. Oh god. <laughs> He's just charging up a nuke. Um... How do I make sure I don't die? There we go. Flash. See it. After getting rid of the evidence, we get a visit by a few of Asterion's friends, reminding him to come to his sugar daddy's promotion. After unsuccessfully persuading them to fight against their master, we end up destroying them anyway and make our way to Cazador's palace. After speedrunning our way through some of the puzzles of the palace, we destroy his banquet of werewolves and make our way to his sex dungeon. Not wanting to waste any time, I cast darkness and started blasting. You wanna take a guess how this fight went considering that only the bats could see through darkness? Yeah, that's right. Our resident vampire lord got taken down by a second level spell. Go figure. After seeing my prowess, a guild of monster hunters agreed to help me fight against the elder brain when the time came. Not like we'd need them, but I appreciated the gesture. Anyways, next on my list was to gain access to the Temple of Baal, in which we needed to prove ourselves by gathering the hands of assassination targets. Luckily for us, there was already an assassin on the loose trying to do the exact same thing. So if we kill the assassin, we technically prove ourselves. We quickly find out he's trying to poison some guests at a wine tasting, and quickly initiate combat with the shape changers he's employed to help him out. After using my big hammer on them, we make the assumption that he's headed towards his next victim, and quickly head to the facemaker's boutique to stop him. He's already here when we arrive, and he has paralyzed the owner of the shop, but we have the power of darkness and a paladin NPC on our side. After using Booming Blade enough times, Delore the inept assassin fell at my feet, and we barely managed to save the shop owner, who gave me a great discount on um, clothing. Awesome. I'm so... I'm so glad I saved you. Your inventory is so helpful to me. OMG, dude. At this point in the run, we're sitting at the level cap of 12, which means we're as ready as we can be for any of the endgame fights. I decided that I had enough of our Disney villain and prepared to enter Raphael's House of Hope. To prepare, I respect to make sure our build was completely built for this entire encounter. 4 levels Warlock, 6 levels Draconic Sorcerer, 2 levels Tempest Cleric, 8 Strength, 16 Dex, 16 Con, 8 Intelligence and Wisdom, and 18 Charisma. As far as items go, we have the Steel Watcher Helmet, the Cloak of Displacement, the Armor of Agility, Legacy of Masters, Boots of Persistence, Charge Bound Warhammer, Shield of Devotion, Darkfire Shortbow, Parry Up to Wound Closure, Ring of Arcane Synergy, and the Ring of Regeneration. Make sure for spells you have Darkness, Booming Blade, or Eldritch Blast, you guys, Shield, Mirror Image Misty Step, and optionally some damage spells like Lightning Bolt and Invisibility as another option. For class features, I chose Distant and Quicken Spells for my meta magic options, and Agonizing Blast and One with Shadows as my Eldritch Invocations. For your feats, take an ability score improvement, that's how I got my stats, and take Warcaster so you have less of a chance of darkness dropping during combat, because even if some enemies can see through it, ranged attacks cannot be made through it, so it mitigates some of the challenge. As ready as I thought I'd be, I completed the ritual to enter his house of hope, and set foot into the job interview of a lifetime. But immediately after entering, I had an idea. I went back to camp to grab all of the water barrels I had been saving up for the entire game, and place them in the Devil's Foyer preparing for a fight I knew was inevitable. We are greeted by a psychotic halfling named Hope, <laughs> lore, who wants us to set her free, but warns of the danger of upsetting the Disney villain in his very home. 
unfortunately for me, I've played this game before, so any anxiety I have is buried deep within my apathy for passion. To get the Orphic Hammer to free hope, you could succeed on a charisma check to get the invitation, but instead, I stole the letter of invitation from the archivist and invaded Raphael's bedroom, finding his Tinder date waiting for him apparently. After swiftly kicking him in the balls, we raid Raphael's safe, finding the passphrase needed to break the seal on the Orphic Hammer. Heading back and grabbing said hammer, we rob the entirety of Raphael's magic item stash, nabbing the gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, which we immediately equip because it's now the statistical best option but we're keeping everything else equipped. We make our way to Hope's Prison, which is really easy to beat with darkness, so just spam your way through the encounter, and save Hope. Now drag your new cleric meat shield to the boss room and prepare for the longest fight of your life. Ideally, you get your gear on your side before you start this encounter, otherwise you might end up reloading a couple of times. I highly recommend casting darkness at the start of combat. You would assume that the Cambians have Devil Sight, them being literal devils, but no, they just have dark vision. I don't know, man, I just make videos. This will prevent them from making massive damage range attacks during the fight. Now, let's see how Raphael fares against us. Hell, hell, hell has its wars. Hell, hell, effect on the cause. Curtain falls, but hold your applause. Squirm, squirm, for now down here come the claws. <laughs> Oh wow, they're they're low. I gotta tank it. You can do two of those in a turn? Holy shit. Okay. Nope, he's still gonna do it, because he has 50 actions in a turn. That's cool. I this one, we got one more attempt before I gotta leave. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. Third ice storm. Okay. They are so low. Here's what I'm gonna do. can spell booming blade 95 on this guy should kill pretty soon it should just be me and my big hammer versus Raphael he has soul over charge now, which is not probably very good. Yeah, he's probably gonna do his whole demon ascension thing. Yeah, okay. Ow! Alright, one potion of supreme healing. And we cast darkness. quite know what to do about this. See, the thing is, if you're out of a certain range of their dark vision, or their uh, double sight, they don't realize that they can do that. So, if we stay way back here, Raphael should not actually chase us down. He should just transform. And then he should stay there, if I'm not mistaken, right? If I'm smart enough? Or maybe, no, maybe never mind. He, he goes for it. What a baller. Ice. Saved against that? That's actually wild.
I'm breaking out all the stops right now. Get rid of one more of these. Let me just walk up here. It's at one HP. Damage, damage, damage. Fireballs, definitely not gonna work here. this. Okay, additional action afterward. He has a high defense, that's really unfortunate, but we'll try it another way. Okay. Okay, buddy. It's okay. We can tank a couple of those. Okay. I need to fly over here. Okay. We're invisible. Now we wait out his bullshit. He is unfortunately gonna heal up, but we can wait it out with one of shadow, with one with shadows. You don't know I'm there, bro. Wait. Okay. Let's do that again. Wait, hold on, I have an idea. Time to get going. Oh! Oh! Oh my god! Wait! You can take a short rest in the House of Hope during combat, guys! What the hell? No shot! This gives me an idea. Oh my god. <laughs> It is cheesy, but do I care? Okay, Sonic Backlash. Okay, we just need to live. We just need to live a little longer. Decide to remove the tension, everybody. But the door wasn't locked, so, um, I take those, bro. Oh, does it not work? Might not be the time. In that case, we just take a potion of angelic reprieve. I had a secondary plan in case that wasn't gonna work, but, you know, it happens. Hello. Hi, buddy. All right, Raphael. Just you, me, and my big hammer. What's in here? With no one in between. Well, let's do mirror image. Yeah. Come here, buddy. Face me like a man. You, my friend, don't stand a chance. DM's only friend is here to destroy you. Oh my god, yes. Come at me, dude. Where did I go? <laughs> you don't know. And you're surprised? Wow. Counter spell. 
No, 73. Oh, shit. Raphael doesn't have counter spell. Um... Doesn't know where I am. You guys want to see something really cheesy? The only time that angelic reprieve potions are actually useful. Alright, booming blade it is. Have you met my friend Big Hammer? Okay. He is currently surprised. See, this is some bull right here. But hey, it gives an excuse to use all these minor potions. <laughs> I want him to use those ranged attacks instead of the uh, ones. Ouch. Scroll of fire shield with that. Okay, attack me, bro. Okay, he's gonna hit with at least a couple. I know he is. He always does. He missed all of them? Oh my god. Alright, big hammer time, baby! Okay, come on, Raphael. Yes! <laughs> After beating Raphael and spending my entire inventory at Disney World, we needed yes. somewhere to restock our supply of spell scrolls and healing potions. And armor. I knew just the place. Oh we bring our good God. friend Aelin to kick this guy in the balls, and then I pretty much proceed to rob everything I can get my hands on. Luckily, this is pretty easy once you've gone through it enough times, but be on the lookout for any annoying magical traps. Turn-based mode is your friend here. After looting our local incel, we set our sights on the end game. And first up was killing Saravok for his gear, because, I don't know, I, th I thought we might need it. And also so we could access Oren's boss fight. Open up the door with your newly proven psychopathy, use darkness on the three death knights, almost die, and then open up the room to find your prey. Wanna take a guess how you should approach this fight? That's right, darkness. Even though killing the three minions buff Saravok, I still recommend killing them first because they have a bunch of annoying spells that can pretty much end up killing you outright. One of them has Counterspell as well, so if you want to cast Darkness, I highly recommend using an Arrow of Darkness first, so Counterspell isn't an issue. I ended combat by hitting Saravok with my big hammer, and I ventured toward, uh, you guessed it, the secret area beneath Room's Rock, because doing things out of order, and just because I can, is hilarious. After opening up the secret passageway and solving some really simple puzzles, you can face off against one of the only dragons in the game, on Sir. The heart of the gate. The waiting storm. The... Right, oh. Alright, let's re... Um... Try this might this. actually be difficult. Onsur is a level 17 undead bronze dragon with 600 hit points on Tactician, with an AC of 19, high damage lightning breath attacks, layer actions, and is overall a f menace to try and do solo. Unless you're me and already had an entire build ready for this encounter. Get ready, because this build doesn't use darkness or a booming blade. Hell, it doesn't use any spells at all, and you barely have to heal yourself during the fight. To figure out how to build anything in Baldur's Gate and D&D in general, you have to analyze the enemy you are fighting. The two main damage types on Sir deals are slashing and lightning damage, and that's pretty much it. In addition, his layer actions and lightning breath are dexterity saving throws, so we would need a build with at least decent dexterity and resistance to lightning and slashing damage, and decent survivability against anything Onser could throw at us. To start, reclass into Rogue with 8 Strength, 17 Dexterity, 16 Constitution, 8 Intelligence, 15 Wisdom, and 8 Charisma. Third level, select either the Assassin or Thief subclass for possible better beginning turns and additional bonus actions. At fourth level, select the Ability Score Improvement for Dexterity and Wisdom, bringing them to 18 and 16 respectively. Bring Rogue up to level 7 for Uncanny Dodge, Evasion, and additional Sneak Attack damage, bringing it to 4d6 additional damage. Evasion makes it so that if we succeed on a Dexterity saving throw, we take no damage. And if we fail, we just take half damage from the effect. Now, this is where it gets weird. Put your last five levels into Bearheart Barbarian, taking the tough feat at fourth level. Barbarian gives you a couple of key features that make this fight possible. 
One is Danger Sense, which gives you advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see. And if you remember, Evasion lets us take half damage from those types of effects on a failure, but no damage on a success. This means that we actually have a really good chance at completely avoiding any of Onsur's lightning attacks. In addition, while raging as a Bearheart Barbarian, you have resistance to all damage, which means the damage is even further halved regardless of anything hitting me or not. And if that wasn't enough damage reduction for you, we also have Uncanny Dodge, which can half the damage dealt to the first attack that hits you in a round, on top of already being halved by Rage. This means effectively that most damage against us is quartered if not negated against Onsur. The items you want to run are the Mask of Soul Perception, the Cloak of Displacement, the Graceful Cloth, the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, the Boots of Speed, the Periapt of Wound Closure, the Ring of Free Action, or the Sparks Wall, the Ring of Regeneration, the Dead Shot, and the Dancing Breeze. The Graceful Cloth boosts your dexterity to 20 and grants an additional plus one bonus to dexterity saving throws. The Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength grant you a flat 23 as your strength score, so your attacks are going to hit much more often. The Boots of Speed grant additional mobility so you can rush down on serve for melee attacks. The Parry Up to Wound Closure grants max healing from your healing potions. And while I don't run it here, the Ring of Free Action will grant you immunity to difficult terrain, paralysis, and being restrained. The Ring of Regeneration will grant you four hit points every turn, which adds up over the course of the fight. The dead shot will decrease our crit number by one, bringing it to 19 or 20. And it gives us a decent ranged option if need be. Finally, the Dancing Breeze is a two-handed finesse glaive, which will allow us to use Reckless Attack in tandem with Sneak Attack, since Reckless Attack grants advantage on attack rolls using Strength, and we're using Strength for the glaive since we have a Strength of 23. Despite what you may think of Sneak Attack, this works because the only requirement for Sneak Attack is that you have advantage and you're using a finesse weapon. It says nothing about attacking with dexterity. <gasps> okay, Jesus. Let's kick it. Okay, so... First of all, Bear Rage. Resistant to all damage. Reckless Attack. Oh, sh oh my god, that's so powerful. <laughs> yes, okay. This might work, this might work. Okay, I, this is my new plan. Rogue Barbarian. And I should just take zero points of damage because I'm amazing. Oh my god, yes. Alright, let's attack Onsir every chance we get. Screw it, crit. Let's get into attack all his allies. Uh, sneak attack. I don't have a sneak attack right now. Let's do whirlwind attack. Just do it. Holy crap! This is the best build. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Lightning breath me. Screw it. Elixir of cloud giant strength. We burn it. Now I have a plus 20 to hit. Okay, we just gotta make that attack roll. You have to make an attack roll against him every turn. Rogue. Reckless attack. Let's go. Keep it up. Critical hit! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god, that's so good. See, we're at 316 now. He should do the thing. He's gonna rise up. He's gonna do his gathering power. Ranged attack, make sure our rage doesn't end. Okay, here we go. Ranged attack again. Another day, another fight. Maximize that damage. Then we will reckless attack you because we got reach. Okay, sneak attack. Ooh, sh**. And succeeded my deck save. That sucks. Okay, we still take half. That's fine. Okay, so just get one more hit in. Okay, 16. He's gonna do a multi-attack against me, or he's gonna do that Okay. Do we live this is really the question. Um, we gotta drink a Supreme. Healing potion. Okay, we have four of them. 60 HP. Let's do reckless attack. 
Critical hit. Second one. Only four. Okay. You guys ready? Pray to God. Only 22 points of damage. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Gonna do that. Man, I'm not succeeding on my deck saves anymore. What's going on? It's okay. We go first. We drink another Supreme. We drink another Supreme. Okay. Uh, Supreme, Supreme, Supreme. Where are you? Screw it. Smoke powder arrow. Take that, bro. Cannot have rage end early. This should be zero. Okay, six. That's fine. Reckless attack. Sneak attack. Nice. Lightning breath. 11 points of damage. That's fine. Alright. Melee. Nine points of damage. That's fine. Okay. On sir, your turn. Okay, he is gonna deal about 20 points of damage to me. Oh, Okay. Screw it. Let's just get the damage in. Pray for a crit. Okay. Do it. Come at me, bro. Only 24. Easy. Easy. Raider, get back in there. We're out of the way of the lightning. Alright. This is probably it. Let's see. Yes! Oh my god. What have you done? Holy sh! <laughs> now it was time to take down Hot Topic E Boy and Red Flag. After making our way out of the electrocution torture basement of Worms Rock, we carefully carve our way through the E Boy's tier 3 subs using my Displacer Beast form from our Illithid powers, and find ourselves dodging landmines he put all over the place until we finally find ourselves facing off against the E Boy himself. I approach this encounter by turning myself invisible, looting the room, then accidentally triggering combat with him. Start by destroying these force curtains using lightning damage, and use reckless attack to stack your sneak attack damage on the adds that are causing you trouble. Using whirlwind attack from the dancing breeze is incredibly useful since enemies tend to surround you in this fight for melee attacks, while Gortash plays like a spacing character in a fighting game. Kill the spellcasters as fast as you can because they will spam command on you and never run out of uses on it, so getting rid of them is the top priority. You will be taking a lot of damage since Bear Rage doesn't resist psychic damage, so you'll be downing health potions like a deadbeat dad drinks whiskey, but try and ration them out as best as you can. Once you kill Gortash's minions, he'll enter Avatar of Tyranny and get all big and scary. Gortash will try and start. <laughs> Jesus. Gortash will try and start fisting you, so make sure he stays out of your no-no square and destroy these manifestations of tyranny to get him off his Viagra that he's stacking with his anabolic steroids. And pray to God you can deal enough damage to him after you've run out of healing potions. After barely surviving that encounter, we once again needed to restock our items. My new strategy was quite literally just stealing everything I could from all the vendors in the city. Only problem with committing grand larceny is apparently only sending like four guards after me, so we pretty much now have the entire game's economy in my pocket, which means I can use the full force of capitalism to take down the rest of the game. Before we do though, I have another class change. Level 5 Gloomstalker Ranger, level 4 Assassin Rogue with Sharpshooter, and 3 levels in Defiend Warlock with Devil Sight and Moma Shadows. This playstyle of build relies on the use of dual crossbows while inside darkness and survivability with one with shadows. Sharpshooter grants the DPS we want, and dual crossbows with level 5 Ranger means we make 3 attacks in a turn max. Now, let's go after the Far Realm's biggest red flag. Whenever you first enter the Trials of Ball, make a quick teleport over here and blast these fools off the edge of existence. This will trigger the trial to enter further into the temple, where you have to kill this guy who has 10 unstoppable stacks. Use a combination of teleportation arrows, Misty Step, and Rogue's Dash bonus action to run him the hell down. Now just spam the shit out of him and call it a day. Every other enemy will despawn, and you're free to move ahead. Once you enter the Ritual Chamber, cast Darkness so you can move forward deep into enemy territory without triggering the cutscene immediately, and use an Elixir of Bloodlust. Get off a cheeky Thunder Arrow on one of the cultists within the Ritual, and get ready for a long battle of attrition, and hiding like a little sissy baby. Target anybody without the unstoppable condition, and focus on knocking away the cultists. You want to be in a 1v1 with Orin so your action economy balances out. 
you're still going to be struggling, but make sure you use One with Shadows to survive, and you'll be home free to take on the Elder Brain. <laughs> Before we head out, I promise I'm changing my class setup for the last time. Five levels Gloomstalker Ranger, three levels Thief Rogue, and four levels into Fiend Warlock with Devil Sight, one with Shadows, and Sharpshooter. This build is pretty much the same as the last one we used, but we're running Thief Rogue instead for the additional attack it will grant with our crossbows, bringing us to four attacks per round, and even more when we first start initiative. Now set sail all by your lonesome across the creepy underground river, destroy some walking brains, and attempt to control the Elder Brain. let's give it a shot. Oh, well. That's the likelihood we succeed and yet- <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. We succeed the first check. All right, let's use dexterity. All right, what's the likelihood we hit in that 20? It's one in 20. No, <laughs> no, 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 we don't. Once you've gotten over your horrendous luck, you are offered a deal by the Emperor to become fully illithid. In a normal run, I would absolutely go for this because it provides so many crazy abilities and benefits. However, I would like to keep my amazingly good looks and my actual stats because we will have much higher AC and better optimized stats for our build than if we swap to full illithid. This also means that we will need to escort the Emperor to the Elder Brain in order to destroy it, and everyone knows how much fun escort missions are. As soon as we teleport back towards the city, we encounter the most annoying and broken enemies in the game. Gith Yankee! Luckily for us, Darkness directly counters them, so just blast your way through their endless spell slots and abilities, and push forward to meet with the NPCs you have learned to not care about after your first playthrough. I swear I don't even... I, I don't know, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Approaching this encounter at the gate is incredibly difficult. I thought that by opening up the Iron Flask, we could actually stand a chance against this ridiculously large encounter. But to no avail. There are simply too many enemies to defeat even with the Emperor and Darkness. Now, we could use our limited invisibility items to simply run past all the enemies here, but I felt like I needed to conserve resources here for the Elder Brain fight coming up. Luckily, after taking an alternate route on the side of the parapets, we found ourselves in a position to sneak past that massively large encounter and move on to the tactical airstrike encounter. <laughs> Yippee. Luckily, you can also just run past this and find yourself ready to face off against the Elder Brain. I was incredibly scared at this point in the run. I had spent a ton of time getting here, and I didn't know if it was even possible to get past the next challenge, or even deal enough damage to the Elder Brain in order to defeat it. The Mind Flayers at the edge of the arena have counterspell, so it's basically impossible to get Darkness off, and the giant red dragon also makes it difficult to even get the Emperor near enough to get the sequence off in the first place. That was until I remembered a broken mechanic of this game. Throwing potions. Whenever you throw a potion onto the ground, there is a small radius in which the potion effects can take place from multiple creatures. This means that we can actually throw a potion of invisibility on the ground and turn both the Emperor and I invisible in order to get past all the enemies here. And we can enter the Elder Brain's, um... Um, realm for the low price of a single invisibility potion. But even so, I was unable to deal enough DPS to the Elder Brain before it destroyed the platforms below me to kill me. I seemed lost and looked to my chat for help, and that's when I saw the message. Some special someone in chat notified me that by using Globe of Invulnerability, it also prevents the platforms from being destroyed below you. So all we had to do was start blasting. Why am I allowed to stay inside and attack at the same time? Are you kidding me? That's all this fight ends up being? That's all it is? God dang it, really? Okay. That's fine, that's fine. Just burn the smoke powder arrows. Call it a day. I think we only need one more round. Oh sh No, I was hastened! Oh. I just need this one more turn, I swear, and we can win this. Okay. Alright. Alright, do we have another potion of haste? Or speed, I mean. 
I don't think we do. Hold on. Let me just let's search this up. Speed. No, we don't have it. Well, here goes nothing, guys. Okay, it's fine. Fine. Second smoke powder arrow. There we go. Let's go. We did it. And somehow, through all the BS I had to deal with, I won with the biggest bag of magic items ever seen and managed to somehow avoid romancing Karlak despite doing all of her quests. In hopes of spending more time with her, we ran to Avernus together just so her heart wouldn't explode and I would no longer be the DM's only friend. Hey guys, thanks for making it this far. I can't believe how popular these videos have gotten and I hope to make more like this in the future. I'm wholeheartedly sorry it took so long to get this one out. There's been a lot of changes to my schedule and personal life within a short amount of time and adjustments come slowly to people like me. However, I have a special announcement I want to make to commemorate the end of my first popular series. Thank you so much again. I've teamed up with one of my special friends and they helped me design t-shirts for the end of the series. Here's their art page in case you want to contact them for commissions and I'm putting out a promo code in order to get 15% off all of your purchases on my store page. Make sure to use code LONEWOLF. If you want to see more content from me, I'll be working on possibly some more Baldur's Gate 3 content, especially when the modding community really takes off. But I'll be trying out some other games that may have similar vibes and I can't wait to see what the future holds. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.